and welcome to today's panel discussion on leading successful remote and blended learning. And after Monday's announcement in the UK, it's ever so more relevant um, in terms of how we are managing this in our schools. Um, I hope that today you'll pick up some nuggets of information that we can use back in our own settings. My name is Evelyn Ford and I'm head teacher at Coptal School in North London in the UK. Today, I am delighted to be joined by a fantastic lineup. I've got a great lineup for you. We have Dr. Michael Malone, Director of Curriculum and Information Services at South Eastern Regional College in Northern Ireland. We have Tuesday Humby, who is the National Director of Teaching and Training at Ormiston Academies Trust in the United Kingdom. We've got Dr. Terry McAdams, Director of Technology, Research and Innovation at Branksome Hall Asia in South Korea. And we have Kadir Adjut, who is Director of Upper School at Beaver Country Day School in the United States. So we are coming from far and wide to bring this session to you today. Um, during this session, we will be sharing our experiences, our challenges and practices of leading teaching and learning during the pandemic. I'm going to have some questions that I'm going to ask our panellists. Um, and the first question I'm going to start with um, asking Kadir, what have been the main challenges with ensuring high quality teaching and learning during the recent times of disruption? Over to you, Kadir. Yeah, thank you, Evelyn, and hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, uh, from our uh, standpoint, I think um, some of the main challenges is that very quickly we realized that everyone became an educator and everyone had an opinion on how we should do things um, because really we uh, we had to start from scratch. I think um, what we needed to do was to understand um, other people's lives. Um, you know, for once we always take into account, um, you know, uh, people when they come onto campus, um, but suddenly we had to understand how people live and, uh, you know, their home situation. We also had to understand better their parents' home situation. Uh, would they be working from home or not? So we had to create um, a schedule with a, a lot of empathy uh, and trying to understand how people live. And that um, made it uh, quite challenging for uh, from that uh, regard. And also, I think, um, trusting ourselves and others uh, and at least trust from others about how we do things. Um, there was a lot of uh, demand to go back to some kind of traditional way of teaching for some reason. Um, but I think as we we're trying to uh, build the plane and flying it at the same time, um, we had to uh, we had to overcome those challenges and make sure that um, people would say, yeah, that that that's working. We we trust you. Um, uh, but those were the the main thing. And I think. Uh, one of the last thing is, um, I would say, is making sure that we were having equitable access to whatever we were doing online and hybrid. Um, those were all the, some of the elements uh, we took into, in, into account. And the day-to-day uh, -day, um, things of like, yeah, uh, a teacher had a, a baby last month. How do we handle that <laughs> when they have to, uh, to, um, to also do work? So. Uh, looking at the at the very personal and the minute thing to the big picture thing, um, there was a series of challenges that keep coming, but um, that's been interesting so far. Oh, thank you. And, you know, you spoke about trust and I think that would resonate with all of us, you know, starting from scratch and having our communities really trust that, you know, that we know what we're doing. And I'm sure that, you know, really resonates with us. Um, Michael, what have been your challenges? Okay, uh, very similar to Kadir uh, in that we have about 4,000 uh, full-time students, 8,000 part-time students. So it's a it's not a homogeneous uh, uh, type of uh, curriculum that we deliver and over 50 different curriculum areas. So we uh, have everything from software engineering to catering and hairdressing. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the needs of students are completely different and we need to be able to react to that. Now, the first thing we did uh, was look at the planning of the curriculum from September right through and trying to learn the lessons from last year. But on top of that, we've had the disruption of enforced lockdowns, 
So we had tried to build some flexibility into the year, but the enforced lockdowns from government made, uh, you know, we had to be agile and change very quickly our approaches. So some of the things that we would have in our practical subjects is we still need to have uh, practical assessments carried out on the premises. So uh, these are bits that can't be created online. If you're coming and do some plumbing activities or hairdressing, they need to be done inside the college wherever possible. And uh, where we're currently dealing with right today is the mitigations around external examinations. Uh, we run a lot of BTEC courses and the guidance literally was changing by the hour yesterday. And we're having to change that guidance to our students uh, today. So that's where I spent a fair bit of time this morning. Now, as well as that, we had to provide a safe environment uh, to the students when they come into the college. So we introduced hand sanitizers, one way systems. We yeah. built screens uh, to create physical distancing inside the classroom. Uh -huh. And we created a COVID isolation uh, procedure so that students, if they do have any symptoms, don't come into the college and likewise staff, but they notify us. And back to what Kadir said, that's the trust element in this. We have to trust staff and students to operate this uh, properly and not operate as policemen in it. And then the, the other aspect is the technology to make it all work. And uh, we created an integrated platform for students to be able to access the resources using uh, technology like Microsoft Teams. We have e-portfolios so that students can access and deposit their evidence uh, online, uh, which is really, really important. And then the, the last point, uh, the last two points I'd make is the connectivity for students. We have lots of students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, and we have loaned out this academic year over a thousand PCs to those students to ensure that they can, in the absence of, of PCs being available from government, we have loaned those out from the college stock. And uh, the final point I'll make is staff training is absolutely vital in this. Staff feel uh, quite stressed at the start because we literally flipped online within a week. Now, we had done an awful lot of prep before that, but even more had to be done during that initial uh, lockdown, and that continues through the year. Thank you. I, I mean, what you've already begun to describe is how you've kind of started from scratch and then been very agile and how you've built on best practice from the first lockdown. And so I think that's what I'd like to move on to with uh, Tuesday and, and Terry. Um, and my question is, in what ways have you worked to develop successful remotes and blended learning in your institutions? And maybe one thing that you've learned from the experience. Can I start with Tuesday? Gosh, one thing we've learned so much, haven't we? I think we all yeah. have, like sitting around the technology. Um, yeah, what even down to you know, what what devices do our children have at home, and we're still learning every single day. Um, I think the way the way we approached it was um, certainly from the first lockdown. You're just thrown into it, aren't you? And we've got forty schools across the country, and suddenly we've got forty heads of teaching and learning who are then looked to to be the experts and we're expected to know everything we're you know these experts of teaching and learning and none of us were we were like what none of us had done that any of this before and then you've got the subject leaders in the same position with all of their teaching staff looking to them and mm. so we we did it by trial and error a lot of trial and error and we're still doing a lot by trial and error but but also through collaboration and for us it's been um been revolutionary really in terms of our collaboration it's it's never been better in our 10 years as a trust because we we knew we had to come together if we were going to do it and we were going to do it well we had to start learning and sharing mm -hmm. and it was the sharing that really surprised me because if I go out to the trust now and say can you send me all in your best geography schemes on x y and z people are a little bit reticent because there's so many experts out there but we knew we knew that none of us really knew what we were doing if we're honest so people were like here you go have this i don't know if it will help and very very quickly we we're able to create this what well, aladdin's cave of resources on you know technical support support for parents um and it was brilliant how quickly that that was set up and turned around 
And then it was about sharing our experiences as well. So for our teaching staff, um, just as Michael's um, said before about, you know, it's scary, wasn't it, for our teachers? Mm-hmm. And we had to, it was all like all overnight, but to be able to share those experiences and say, do you know what, it's okay to not expect them to go to live teaching overnight. Let's let's go bit by bit by bit. Let's do recorded lessons first. Now let's start using a chat function. Hey, now we're ready for our cameras on. And being okay about that and allowing that. Um, so I guess I, my, my biggest learning point is, I suppose, around the power of that collaboration, which seems silly, doesn't it? Because everybody should know that. But to watch it really come to fruition through this has been like, well, inspiring, actually. I'm really, really proud of our staff. Thank you. And I think that goes back to what we started with, you know, that word about trust. And it really is about, you know, staff trusting each other, trusting leaders of the school. And I really like that Aladdin's cave that you've now been able to create. And I'm sure that, you know, that's true of schools up and down the country. So really interested to hear what's happening in um, South Korea. So uh, our experience was a little bit different uh, because we were very close to China. So when the initial outbreak happened, we had contacts in China. We saw that a lot of the teachers had flown all over the world and they were trying to deliver online. And we knew that it was inevitable that we were going to uh, have COVID within the country before long. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, uh, we actually acted. We didn't want a crisis response. We wanted a meaningful online learning program. And uh, so the biggest learning point perhaps is that if you do plan and prepare, then you are able to execute uh, a system that's very effective. So we created a, a six stage framework that uh, is going to be published in the International Schools Journal in the next edition. And the first stage was looking at our school mission, uh, which is to challenge and inspire girls to love learning and shape a better world. And we wanted to deliver a program that actually met that criteria. So it wasn't enough just to get students uh, devices and access to internet. We actually wanted to have a truly meaningful program. Uh, And so all of the decisions we made were through that lens. And because we had that clear goal of we want this to be every bit as good as face to face lessons, I think I think that helped bring everybody together. And going back to what Tuesday said with collaboration, I don't think I've ever worked anywhere where teachers have collaborated, generated ideas and shared those ideas around. But going back to our framework. The second stage, we wanted to identify the barriers to learning. We, we wanted to see what areas would be an issue. So uh, we did a, a significant amount of research and uh, I found a meta-analysis that was conducted in 2018 that identified 65 barriers to learning while delivering online programs. And, and these were categorized into five areas. So we looked at the barriers and we tried to address those. For instance, technology, uh, whether or not teachers know how to use technology. Uh, uh, Like Michael, we had uh, learning management software in place. We had e-portfolio software. One of the biggest barriers for us was language. We have young children in the school whose English are not that well developed and parents perhaps don't speak English. So we needed auto translation tools. We We knew that we needed to collaborate with the parents, especially in the younger years. And so there was a number of sort of areas that we thought this is going to be an issue. What can we put in place to ensure that, that, that it doesn't happen? Um, we, we did PD with the, uh, the teachers. Uh, we taught them how to, to do synchronous and asynchronous learning. We'd already been using learning management systems. We pride ourselves on technology in our school. Uh, we identified that online learning was going to put in more hours for teachers than normal face-to-face learning Uh, and all the sort of research has shown that teachers are often working up to 20 hours more a week uh, because of the preparation time. So we try to organize planning by grade level and by department and the only way that this was practical was to ask the teachers to come into school and, and deliver the lessons in their classes. 
that so they were in a, a comfortable environment with no other distractions and they had technology support available whenever there was an issue we had someone there we, we knew that our network infrastructure would handle it um, so from that perspective we we looked at lots and lots of issues uh, we found online software that could that we could use for for things like virtual reality simulations we made sure that we could have breakout rooms so that the students could collaborate we wanted to make sure that the atls the social skills collaboration skills uh, were included self-management so it very much was a case of sitting down and, and planning all this and then getting feedback from students and parents. We conducted surveys after the first week. We then changed things around. We altered the school timetable. We then resurveyed students and parents, and the feedback was that we'd made significant improvements. And uh, we then shared best practice. We reflected on everything, and we created a, a, an online document where, where teachers were able to share all their ideas. Well, I did say that we were going to take away some nuggets and that six stage framework has really pricked my ears. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do now is just ask the panelists to leave us with one you know, snippet, one piece of advice um, that you would give leaders today, you know, in education, we're all kind of doing the best we can. But if I can start with um, Terry, again, I'm going to go back and say, give me just one quick piece of advice. Oh, I, I had four. OK, one. One. I, I would say uh, this has been an incredibly stressful time for, for teachers, but also for school administrators. Mm -hmm. we, we worked through our summer because we had teachers arriving yeah. uh, and we had to sort out quarantine and so on. So make sure that you look after yourself. Yeah. Uh, do, do some exercise. I do Qigong every morning, mm -hmm. do meditations. Uh, turn off your electronics before bed, make sure you get enough sleep and generally look after yourself because if yeah. you're overtired and overstressed, you're going to make poor decisions and that doesn't yeah. help anybody. 100% totally agree with that one. Kadir? Yeah. I think it's a great, um, uh, more than a piece of advice, it's like a suggestion to think about what will you say next when the school says, no, you can't do that. Um, mm -hmm. I think you, you, we, we've shown that we can do a lot, if not everything, um, in those very difficult situations. Um, but uh, keep, keep thinking in mind, like um, for me, uh, and that's what we've done at school, what would we teach or what would we um, prioritize if we had only one week um, to teach with the kid? What would we do? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's going back to this uh, focusing on the, the essential. And uh, as we uh, have used the, the term here um, at my school and in other schools too, how do we marry condo the curriculum, but also marry condo a lot of our practices to kind of uh, make sure we focus on the essentials and then um, get to the point. Yeah, I like that. And in our last minute together, I'm going to ask Tuesday followed by Michael. OK, well, I'll be really quick. Um, I say my my best advice is just don't do any of this alone. If you're a single academy trust or a school that, you know, you, you're feeling on your own at the moment, just get in touch with kind of any one of us. There's so many people out there in the system yeah. who would just open arms, come on in, um, learn together, collaborate. Um, there's, there's just never been a better time for it. So thank you. And Michael, final word. Yeah, uh, a couple of things. First of all, we want, from a student's point of view, we want them working collaboratively online. So we use online and on campus, and we have forbidden the use of the word remote. We don't want the students remote. We want the students working together and learning from each other. And the second bit, and it picks up on all the other points, and that is not to waste a good crisis. A <laughs> crisis generates opportunity. Yeah. And there are massive opportunities and learning that has taken place so far. Thank you so much. Thank you, panellists, uh, for joining us on this session. And thank you, attendees. I hope you got some nuggets that you can take away with you. Thank you.